Good morning, and welcome to worship this morning. Let's stand for our call to worship. Uh, these verses are from Psalm 47. It says, God has ascended amid shouts of joy, the Lord amid the sh sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God, sing praises to our King, for God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. Let's lift our voices together this morning with O oh, Our Lord. kids and grace to you in peace from me your dad through Jesus Christ my son your savior through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit who has set up residence in your heart doing a shaping work and comes upon you in power to be my witnesses grace and peace to you and all God's people said amen I invite you to take a few moments greet a few people you didn't come with and then I'm gonna have you seated after that
I'd invite you to be seated. I just want to pause as we begin worship to say to all the moms, Happy Mother's Day. And uh, I just want to take some time and say a prayer for moms. I find it interesting when I read through the Bible and I get to Genesis 1 to begin with in chapter 2 and into chapter 3, that before sin ever entered the world, there was something that wasn't good, and God said it. And he said, it's not good that man should be alone. Amen? (laughs) And so he created woman. And how we have needed woman to nurture, to be the mom who cares and watches out and is there with a listening ear, and to be our counterpart in life. And God knew exactly what he was doing. And so I'd love to say a prayer for the moms as we continue in worship. So Lord God, we approach your throne on behalf of the mothers that you've entrusted with the care of your most precious little ones. We thank you for creating each mom with a unique combination of gifts and talents. We thank you for the sacrifice of each mom that she gives for her children, a self-sacrifice, and for the late nights spent rocking a colicky infant. Thank you for hands that are calloused from washing and wiping and scrubbing and mixing and baking and stirring and hugging and patting and disciplining and holding and writing and erasing and painting and pouring and so much more. We thank you for the gift of time that moms give their kids. Whether it's stay-at-home moms, working moms, moms who have some combination of the two, we thank you for the flexibility of moms, for their tirelessness, their perseverance, and their devotion. And we pray that you give each mom strength. Help her to see in every mundane task that the eternal significance that you place on motherhood she's a part of. And help her to understand that the most radical, world-changing events may be happening anonymously right in her home. Help her to forgive those who undermine her significance. And we especially pray for single moms who must lean solely on the fathering of their children. We thank you that you are the big arms around children who may never forget their earthly father. And we also pray for the mother who never had the honor of bearing children, but whose nurturing extends to the many poor and needy that cross the threshold of their lives. And we ask you to be the daily bread of tired moms. We ask you to be the living water. We ask you to be their source of spiritual and physical strength. And we pray that same grace that flowed from the Father to the Son to us in salvation will flow from moms to their children. And we pray that each mom would reject perfectionism and embrace the goodness of the gospel. And we pray the rhythms of repentance and forgiveness that shapes every home. Lord, we pray that you would give each mom a worshipful reverence of you, the creator, the sustainer of life. Help each mom to rest in the knowledge that they are but stewards of your children and that only your spirit can produce change into the hearts of each boy and girl. May each mom find rest in you. And most of all, Lord, on this day in which we honor moms, may we love and cherish the special women that you have, who have borne us, who have nurtured us, who have prayed for our well-being. May our hearts overflow with gratitude to you who formed and knitted each of us in our mother's womb. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name and to your glory. Now God's people said, amen. If you'd like to stand, we're going to continue in worship.
please respond in the yellow words. Jesus Christ has come into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Since we have a great high priest who has gone into heaven, Jesus Christ, Son of God, let us fall firmly to the faith we profess. Let us praise his holy name. Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor, power, and strength be to our God forevermore. Alleluia. Amen. Alleluia. like kids are headed off for kids worship and if you think you're a kid you can go too <laughs> it's a good time I'm Pastor Tom Swearinga and um, now serving as an interim here for the current and near future looking forward to what God may have in store for us I'm married to Margie we've been married for 45 years we have four kids and eight grandkids who uh, kind of keep us running and I know you hit that kind of sort of retirement and the grandkids older and life goes really fast. Anybody agree with that? It really speeds up. 
But we grew up in Holland, and uh, no competition, of course, between Holland and Hudsonville, so we won't go there. But it is good to be in Hudsonville. I've been in ministry for 38 years, served in a wide variety of ministry contexts. Uh, most recently, uh, worked for the last four years as missional discipleship and outreach leader at Gun Lake Community Church and RCA congregation out by Gun Lake and uh, did that halftime and have been working halftime at West Michigan Auto Auction, uh, driving around a four-state area and trying to figure out where I am. So on any given day, who knows? So as I enter I'm here, I'll be doing a couple of days a month yet at the auto auction just to continue employment there and relationships that have developed with over 100 drivers over the last four years that I really don't want to give up because they are community as well. So. Uh, We'll just see how God integrates that. So if I tell too many auto auction stories, you can tell me to be quiet, but you do tell a lot out of how life happens. So those will show up along the way. Today we're going to focus on ascension. And uh, I'd invite you to open your Bibles. I think we'll start with Luke 24, just a few verses there, and then we'll go to Acts chapter 1, and I'll be Referring to some other scriptures along the way, I would highly encourage you in this very important time of remembering to take some time over this next week and just read through John 14, 15, 16, and 17. Next Sunday night, we're going to be gathering with two other churches. We'll be celebrating uh, Pentecost. But before Pentecost came Ascension. And if you can just backtrack the gospel for a moment and key markers in the gospel story of redemption when it comes to Jesus, you look at the birth of Jesus, so we do Christmas, and we remember, and we remember always. And then we look at the life of Jesus, which Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the life of Jesus. Read them. Be immersed in them. He's the model. He's the one we follow. He's the one who invites us to follow. And, and then you come to Good Friday and the death of Jesus, which we remember in Good Friday. And then it's Resurrection Sunday, Easter. And then sometimes it's like, well, Pentecost shows up down the way, but what about Ascension? And you'll see today that Ascension is another key time in that whole movement of God's redemptive plan that if ascension happened, hadn't happened, Pentecost wouldn't have happened and the Spirit wouldn't have been poured out. So we're going to take a look today at, so uh, what about the meaning of the ascension? Uh, what, what benefit is it to us? And under the theme of um, coming together and asking, what are you waiting for? So in Luke chapter 24, The resurrection has just happened. Jesus appears to the disciples on that Easter Sunday night. And uh, picking up at verse 45, Jesus opened their minds, that is, the disciples who were gathered in the room, so that they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And when he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. Into Acts chapter 1. We're going to pick up at verse 1, read the first 11 verses, and you may note that Luke, who wrote Luke in the Gospel account that we just read of the Ascension, is also the author of Acts. He's the historian. And he's writing to one of his disciples, Theophilus. In my former book, the book of Luke, Theophilus, 
I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them the command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken out before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. And that's really that next marker of the story. It's Jesus is coming again. So I don't know about you, uh, but I do not like to wait. I don't like to wait for most anything. Anybody else agree with that? I have some pet peeves about waiting. One of them is in all the miles that I've driven over the last few years in particular, sometimes six, seven, eight hundred miles a day, I hate coming to a red light and waiting for air to pass by. No vehicles, just air, nothing. But it seems like 10 minutes later, you're still waiting for the air to go by. Irritates me. Why do I have to wait? Waiting. My guess is when you go grocery shopping and you get all the stuff in your cart, that when you look at the checkouts, you don't choose the longest line. Does that that kind of hit it most often? You kind of look for, where can I get through really quick? How can I most quickly? Where is the shortest line? Scan where it is. Because I don't like to wait. There's a reason they call waiting rooms waiting rooms when you go to the doctor. You wait. You wait till your name is called. And and then after a while, you wait for when you get to have your tests. Then you wait for the results. Because waiting is a part of what we do. And there's some negative sides to waiting. There's, oh, what's going to happen? And I can't stand this. And I'm impatient. And I want to get moving. And I mean, I sometimes have it on Sunday mornings. I get up and I have to preach someplace. And I'm working on my sermon about 6 o'clock in the morning. And I'm thinking, why don't we just do church right now? This would be a really good time. But i got to wait. There are good things to wait for as well. When you're pregnant and you find out you're pregnant, you can't wait until that date that the doctor said would be the birth date of the child projected according to his or her best calculations. All at once, that date is highlighted in your mind. And people will say, oh, you're pregnant. When are you due? When is it going to... Because you're waiting with expectation and anticipation and excitement and joy. You can't wait for it to happen. There's that expectation that would take place. Anybody who's like 12 or 13 or 14, man, I remember those days dreaming of the day I turned 16 and would go to the Holland Police Department and take a police officer for a ride and get my license. I waited with great expectation and anticipation and felt sorry for the officer. (laughs) But you wait. Vacations. Retirement. I don't know what it is, but there's parts that have us almost irritated in waiting, and there's parts of, I can't wait for this to happen. I'm so excited. I'm anticipating it so much. Well, here we find the disciples in waiting mode. 
And I simply entitled this, I mean, what are you waiting for? Because they're waiting for something. And if you can do a brief flashback, and I'll mention these verses quite quickly, and that's why I've encouraged you to go back and read through these passages, but John 14 and 15 and 16 and 17 lay out pretty, pretty clearly what it is that the disciples are waiting for. In fact, beginning in verse 12, and we could look at a whole lot more than that, and will in coming weeks and months, Jesus says to his disciples, this, the last teaching he gave to his disciples, they've just celebrated the Lord's Supper. Judas has been excused. He's going to end up by the end of the night in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to be taken captive, and he's going to be put to death after a trial. Here is his teaching. For three or four chapters as it's recorded in our Bibles. And these are the words that they would hear before he exited and they're in true wait mode. In verse 12 he says, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. Pause. Anybody who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. I'll just, how many of you have faith in Jesus? Okay? And what had Jesus been doing? I mean, read through the Gospels. The stories that flow from them, beginning like in Mark, where Jesus is baptized and immediately he goes out and begins to proclaim the good news because that's one of the works that Jesus did. He was this high priest and this king, but also to begin with this prophet who brought the good news, and that's what the gospel writer of Mark says. He proclaimed the good news, repent and believe. And he's simply saying, you, you all are going to do this. Anybody who has faith in me your life is going to be a life of proclaiming the good news. There's a prophetic part of our lives in that proclamation. Like I said, we're just scratching the surface this morning of much. Jesus went about healing. Read the stories in the Gospels. The paralyzed who are walking, the man in the pool of Shalom, who is able to be restored to life after waiting and waiting the woman who touched Jesus and immediately found her issue that had eaten up all of her resources to try to deal with the pain and suffering she was going through, healed just like that. The blind are seen. The lepers are being healed. Huh. That must have been something for the disciples to reflect on a lot. You're going to do what I've been doing healing, the work of a priest. And, and then it seemed like wherever Jesus went, especially early in the ministry, it was like he was casting out demons all over the place. But when you think about it, Jesus brought light into the world like light had never been brought. He was the Son of God and He came to bring the kingdom and the clashing was happening and where the light went, the darkness could not get away. So the darkness was showing itself up and Jesus was casting it out and saying, be out of here. It's a kingly role where you step in and you take control in the kingdom. And no wonder He taught us to pray, Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You're going to do the things I've been doing and even greater things. I don't know what those greater things are. This blows me away. But we'll see over this coming week and as you read through these verses in John 14, 15, 16, and 17, and as you get into the book of Acts, how the church steps out and brings the good news and brings healing and sets prisoners free, the marching orders that Jesus had. So we spoke a little bit longer on that one. It's pretty key there. Jesus goes on in verse 13 of chapter 14. He says, I'm going to do whatever you ask in my name. I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to give you another counselor to be with you forever Verses 16 and 23, another counselor. And the way they would hear that was another like what? 
And the word that he uses is an interesting word because it has two forms in the Greek. One is heteros, and you understand that's where we get the word heterosexual. Somebody different than us, man and woman, were different from each other. That's heterosexual. And the other word is alos, one just like the same, the same thing. And so Jesus uses the word alos here, and he says, you're going to get another counselor just like me. You're going to have the Spirit living within you. I'm going to be present with you. This counselor is going to be with you. And you can move on. There's so many verses here. Verse 26, The counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I've said to you. So there's a task that the Spirit is about that we're waiting for. And then in verse 8, um, I'm, at, I'm just going to pause for a moment there. There's this interlude that takes place in chapter 15, and it's that wonderful picture where Jesus says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. Remain in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Abide in me, remain in me, abide in me, remain in me. Bear fruit, abide in me, again and again. And then you get to chapter 16, and you find out that the Spirit is going to testify about him. And in 16, verse 7, it's even for your good that I'm going away. Now, how could that be? If I were a disciple there, how could it be that my rabbi who had taught me, who had lived, poured himself into me, who had been the model for my life, who invited me to come and follow, and I left everything to go and follow, this rabbi who had at one point sent me out and said, go and preach the good news and cast out demons and... Watch what happens when the gospel light comes on in a world of darkness. Matthew 9, Matthew 10, Luke 9, Luke 10. They'd gone out and they came back so excited. Oh, Jesus, it's amazing. Even the demons came out and Jesus said, don't get all enthralled with the demons coming out. When somebody comes to Jesus, comes to me. When somebody comes to the Father, get all excited about that. My paraphrase there. So the disciples are in this context of waiting and they're reflecting in a point where here's Jesus teaching, it's better for you that I'm going away. And then he goes on and says, I'm going to guide you into all truth. I'm going to speak. He's only going to speak what he hears. He's going to bring glory to me. In a little while, you're not going to see me anymore. And then after a while, you're going to see me. Wow. How do you take that all in? But it's not the end of the story. So Jesus tells them to wait, and the Spirit is going to be poured out. And then Jesus disappears into the clouds, the ascension, 40 days after the resurrection, 10 days before the Spirit was poured out. Now, it wasn't like they had a calendar. It wasn't like they could go to their daily planner and say, Oh, yep, there was the ascension. In 10 days, he's going to raise from the dead. They were in the middle of redemptive history being unfolded, and God had called them in to participate in this redemptive history, and they were following the lead of their master, and they were open to where the Spirit would lead them. And so when he ascended into heaven, Luke 24 says they worshipped him, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They stayed continually at the temple praising God. And they could do that because they had faith in what Jesus had told them. They had faith in the one who had paid the price on the cross for them. So what's the benefit of the ascension for you and for me and for the church? The reading we saw on the screen earlier and responded to comes out of the catechism where the question is asked, what benefit is the ascension for you? And the first thing that shows up is this. He pleads our case in heaven in the presence of the Father, or in another translation, he's our advocate in heaven before the Father. He pleads our case before the Father. It has to do with him bringing his children before the Father. It has to do with identity. 1 Peter 3.22, and referring to Jesus, Peter writes, He who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, he's with angels and authorities and powers in submission to him. 
And in Romans 8, 31 through 34, it isn't like Jesus just went up into heaven and he's kind of like a, a, a person watching a game unfold, watching our lives unfold, like there's no intervention or interaction and he's just sitting around next to the throne. But in Romans chapter 8, in this powerful, beautiful picture of the work of the Holy Spirit and of Jesus, Paul says to the church at Rome, you know, the Holy Spirit is interceding for you, but Jesus is interceding for you too. That's what he's doing at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is interceding for you. He's, on your behalf, interceding with the Father, being your advocate, standing up for you, having your blind side, not because you deserved it, not because you went to church the right amount of times, not because you went to the right Christian school, not because you learned enough scripture, not because you behaved well enough, but because he decided in his sovereign love to call you son and daughter. And Jesus came and paid the price. So the father hears the son interceding on our behalf. And the Son is the one that we read about in Hebrews chapter 12 where we're encouraged to keep our eyes focused on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him, get this, for the joy set before him endured the cross. And he wasn't doing it for his sin because he didn't have any sin. The joy was our sin. Being forgiven. Paying the price setting us free, giving us life everlasting, receiving that identity as sons and daughters of the Most High. And then in 1 John 2, verse 1, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So just to pause for a moment in the ascension and all that takes place. Do you have anything in your life, a separator, a missing the mark, that you need one who has paid the price to stand before the Father and say forgiven? It's taken care of. I did it. It was my joy on the cross. And when I look into a daily life, there's plenty that Jesus has to intercede on my behalf. It's what happened at the ascension. It was a part of God's plan of redemption that we have our counselor, our advocate in heaven with the Father, and the ascension is for us. And where I've not listened and where I've not heard, where God has spoken, and, and there's always this question in my mind, what are you saying today, Lord? What do you have to say to me? I get up in the morning, Lord, what do you have today to say to me? And I can listen, and then if he says, sometimes through the Scriptures, sometimes through this internal nudge that fits with the Scriptures and with others who are a part of life, here's what I have to say, then I need to pause and move. And sometimes I don't move. And I need forgiveness because God has a good news that needs to go out from any of us. You don't need a theology degree to bring the good news. You just need to be rubbing shoulders with people around you in your neighborhood and in your workplace and in your marketplace and in your extended families and for all the people that God puts in front of you to bring the good news. Like those who have faith will do what I've been doing and one of it is bringing the good news. And when I fail to act, we're still living on this earth and we're waiting for the coming of Jesus again. We can't wait. But then the enemy comes in with his deceit, deceit and his accusations and starts beating us up. Anybody ever have that? Man, you're a lousy Christian. You really think God can forgive that? Do you really think you can hear the voice of God? You sure messed up on that one. And the accusation happens and the deceit happens. But Jesus is pleading on our behalf as our advocate. And the ascension is for us, and it's good news. We are his children. And we can say to the enemy in the midst of the battle, 
I'm a child of God, leave me alone. Leave my kids alone. Leave my spouse alone. Leave my grandkids alone. Leave my house alone. Leave my car alone. (laughs) Because we're children of the Heavenly Father. Second, this is phenomenal. We have our own flesh in heaven. A guarantee that Christ, our head, will take us, his members, to himself in heaven. It means I belong. It means you belong. Talk about comfort in life and in death. We belong to the one who is in heaven. We belong to the one who has gone before us. And the fact that he's there is a guarantee. It it, it isn't like some guarantees. I mean, you all know guarantees that you get when you buy something and then you wonder, is it really good or is it not good? And how long will it last and do I have to pay extra for it? And we'll give you a three-year extension if you just pay a little bit more. This is a guarantee that's taken care of. It's firm. It's solid. Now, just let a few passages speak here. Just listen to the word. I don't even have to elaborate on it. John 14, 1 through 4. Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come back and take you to be there with me that you also may be where I am. You know the place where I'm going. And then one of the disciples says, oh, we really don't know. And then Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You know the way. John 17, 24, the prayer that Jesus is praying for his followers. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you have loved me before the creation of the world. I want them to be here with me, Lord. And there he is at the right hand of the Father. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. That's powerful. When we were dead in transgressions, God, through Jesus, made us alive with Christ. It's by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Boy, does that ever set the context, doesn't it? Should we do good works? Yes. Why do we do good works? Because we're thankful. We just want to say, God, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that he's at your right hand. Thank you for pouring out the Holy Spirit. And these good works that you've prepared in advance were the workmanship that you've created, verse 10, to do good works for the kingdom here on earth, for the coming of the kingdom right here that people might taste of it. The ascension is a benefit for us. And third, and we'll really expand on this next Sunday night, he sends his spirit to us on earth as a counter-pledge by whose power we seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and not the things on earth. Anybody have trouble with that? I mean, does this stuff on earth kind of beckon you? Now, I'll be a little bit honest. You'll probably get sick of auto auction stuff along the way. But sometimes there are cars that come through the auto auction that I kind of drool about, okay? So um, I'm thinking, man, if I just had that vet, I could do pastoral calling a whole lot better. <laughs> and, and then you get to drive it, you know, and so you get to rev the motor up and all the, all the buyers are gathered around the car and you're going, rrr, rrr. it's hard not to focus on earthly things. You walk in a store. What in a store is not earthly? What advertised on TV is not earthly that beckons you to come because your life would be of much greater quality if this were part of your life. And certainly stuff is a part of our lives. God allowed things to be created to sustain and to give life to us. And it's incredible how he cares for us. But 
when that becomes the focus, we get in trouble. And the focus needs to be not the things on the earth, but the things that are above. And so our focus is, Jesus, what do you have today? Holy Spirit, what are you saying today? And it's this counselor who is with us that we talked about. This one just like the one we had. And this one just like the one he had. The presence of God is there through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is sent. Remember Jesus, he's in heaven on your behalf. And the Spirit is right there to draw us into intimacy with the Father. That presence of God being there wherever we go. And the power that is there coming upon us with power and giving us authority so much more to learn and to step into. So by the Spirit's power, we make the goal of our lives not earthly things, but the things above where Christ is seated at God's right hand. Paul to the church at Colossae, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Since you have been raised with Christ, it isn't since you're going to be raised with Christ, you have been raised with Christ. Anybody who has faith in me, since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So with this presence with us and this power, we're able to step out with the presence of the kingdom as we carry that with us. And if the ascension had not happened, there would be nobody there to plead our case in heaven. We'd be left on our own. We'd be left with our works. We'd be left wondering right to the day of our last breath, did I make it or not? And what we have is the assurance that comes in knowing that Jesus Christ paid the price and the debt is taken care of and God's unconditional love reigns. So the work of the Spirit wouldn't be a part of our lives because the Spirit wouldn't have been poured out. So there wouldn't have been people coming to faith because there is no justification. Jesus paid the price once and for all. There wouldn't be this ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives where he shapes our lives. We call it sanctification. There wouldn't be the empowerment that comes upon us. And there's an episode in which only the Spirit does what the Spirit could do, but he uses broken people as his vessels to do that work. And then there's this community that gathers together that the Holy Spirit brings together is different than the community that you're a part of when you're working at the auto auction where you have a community of 100 workers that you learn to get to know and to love and to care for, but it's a whole different fabric about what, does it, what glues us together. What glues us together is a job at the auto auction. But we get to be a part of the community of God, and God has a plan and a purpose for us. There wouldn't be, if the ascension hadn't happened, the pouring out of the Spirit hadn't happened, there wouldn't be the fruits of the Spirit. The love and the joy and the peace and the patience and the loving kindness and the goodness and the faithfulness and the gentleness and the self-control. And when you become a believer, you get all of it. You get all of that fruit and you get to grow in it the rest of your life. And it's always growing. I mean, it's growing all the time. It's every time I think I'm doing pretty good in the patience level, and I'm thinking on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably a 7 or 8, and I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Something happens in life, and all at once I realize I'm back to being like a 1 or a 2 on a different plateau of growth. Believe me, I can be pretty patient out on the road till I get cut off. And all at once my scale goes, zoop. And I'm sitting at the red light with the person who cut me off, and they're parked right next to me, and I'm looking over there kind of fuming, and I'm thinking... If my front window worked, <laughs> I would lower my front window and give them a piece of my mind. And then there's this spirit nudge that says, and what would you say if they showed up in church on Sunday and heard you preach? <laughs> because there's that need to keep growing and the spirit to be there to nudge us and to show us and bring us back into the word and to shape us. And the gifts of the spirit, which are poured out, incredible. The list could go on and on. But I am who I am. My identity is given. I belong. I'm a part of the family. He's in heaven on my behalf. And there's this presence and power that is given. And Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you and I'm not going to forsake you. So don't forget who you are as you step out this week. 
And don't forget who's in heaven standing before the Father on your behalf. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy. Tell the enemy where to go. I'm a child of God. Go to the cross of Jesus and he'll deal with you. And remember who you are. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old has gone. The new has come. And in Romans 8, 15, back in that passage we've been looking at, where Jesus says, I'm interceding on your behalf, Paul says, you didn't receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Daddy, Father. And the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So what am I going to do as I step out? I'm going to bring the good news. I'm going to bring the presence of Jesus wherever I go and pray, Lord God, let me be a part of the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And I'm going to listen to the word of Jesus. I, I just resonate through the Gospels. Just trust me. Just trust me. I'm there for you. And I can't wait for his return. Can't wait. Amen? So, Lord God, I pray your blessing on each one of us here today. I pray that in the places that you lead us as we step out, as those who are sons and daughters of the Most High, as a part of your family, your army, your bride, your body, that we would step out as ambassadors of the good news who bring healing to the broken and are used in setting prisoners free. And where we need healing and where we need freedom and where we need good news, Lord God, I pray that you will speak to us in our time with you this week, that you'll speak through your word to our hearts. You'll speak in our time of prayer. In the midst of a night, if you need to wake us up and speak to us, you'll wake us up and speak to us and remind us, I'm with you wherever you go, and you would get the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and respond in worship with the first place.
may be seated. I'd like to ask the deacons to come up as we receive our morning offerings. And uh, when they've come up, I'd like to say a prayer for our offering. Lord God, thank you for uh, your promise to us that you're going to meet our every need. Thank you that you've met needs, just basic, the clothing and the food and the homes and the transportation. You've met needs way beyond that. You've met needs for relationship. You've met needs for community. You've met needs for family. And as we give our gifts to you, we're simply saying to you, thank you, Lord. We trust you that you meet our every need physically, spiritually, relationally, emotionally, you're our king. We praise you through these gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, well, I guess good afternoon. Um, before we finish the service, uh, if you look in the order of worship, you'll see we have a time of farewell. Um, I'd like to invite Ellie, if you would join us up here with Matt. Today, is uh, this was the last service that Matt is going to be up here in front with us. Uh, as we mentioned a few weeks ago, he has taken an uh, opportunity to have a worship leader job in another local church, and so 
it's time to say farewell, not goodbye, because we'll, we'll run into you again, I'm sure. And so on behalf of council, I just wanted to take a minute to say a few words of thanks. Um, if you haven't been here for a, a number of years, you may not know that Matt and Ellie both grew up in this church, and so it's been my pleasure to see them grow from young children to, to adults and to take part in our, in our life here at Emmanuel. So, um, yeah, they've, they've been here a long time and we're going to miss them. And we just want to say thank you very much uh, for your time of service here. And we do have a small gift for the two of you as another way to say thanks. So thank you much. Thank you, Ellie. And uh, since Pastor Bob left, uh, Kurt Hogelboom has been the chair of the worship committee and has been working really closely with Matt, so he wanted to possibly say a few words, and if not, he wanted to lead us in a prayer. Thanks, Kendall. And uh, yes, correct, Kendall. I have uh, got to know Matt a little bit more this year. Uh, we worked um, trying to keep Matt supported um, and I think that was a neat time um, so I get the opportunity to pray for Matt and for Ellie and I would also like to ask if there's anybody that would like to come up um, I feel like this is uh, kind of like sending Matt and Ellie off on a mission trip I choose to think of it that way um, that they're going with our support so if there's a few of, of you um, we'll uh, gather in the front here like we've done with uh, um, different opportunities. Um, as I was sitting here this morning, I was thinking about Matt and, and Ellie and uh, a tradition that we've had at Emmanuel at the end of the year. We uh, celebrate the end of the year with uh, an Ebenezer service and we put up stones. And these, are, these stones are reminders of uh, where we've been maybe something that's happened throughout the year, and I really hope and pray that Matt and Ellie, both of you, look back at Emmanuel and say, there's a few different stones I could have put up. Um, we grew, we laughed, we cried, um, and Matt, I mean, what I want to say is, you know, Pastor Bob moved on after being here for so many years, and uh, Matt was the consistent face that we got to see um, at the 11 o'clock service, and you did a great job. And uh, I really thank you for that. And I know you couldn't do that without the support of your good wife, Ellie, too. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you are a great and mighty God. And I thank you how um, you come and you interact with us in so many different ways. And I know that you have interacted with Matt and Ellie and you have worked in their hearts, and you have led them um, to get together and be married, first of all. And now you have come into their lives, and you have spoken softly, you've spoken loudly, and you have urged them into a new chapter. And they will be joining the family of God at Ivanrest Church, and I thank you for that church, and I pray, I pray that you would be with Matt as he learns a whole new family there, and he learns um, what it means to be a worship leader at, at um, Ivan Rust. And I thank you for his time that he has led us here these years, and I thank you for his heart for worship, his heart for ministry, and um, I thank you that we got to share in that with him. And now, as uh, this was his last service here, I just uh, thank you again for that time that we had with him. And I pray your overall blessing in their lives and, and that we might again meet up in different times and places in our lives and, and encourage each other. And we pray this all in Jesus' precious name, amen.
I'd like to invite you all to stand, and I'd like to give you God's parting blessing, and then the worship team is going to lead us in a song of God's blessing. As you go your way, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up a really big smile of his face upon you and give you peace no matter what the week brings. May he bring you peace. And all God's people said, Amen.